Welcome to On The Point Podcast, a podcast for all things Overwatch with a heavy focus on League, discussing roster moves, weekly matchups, and the reverse sweep performed on the Boston Uprising instead of by them. Yeah, the seventh seal of the apocalypse was broken, and it, it, it's just, this, it's this week a, was weird. It's been a weird season. Uh, it's yeah. been a weird Season. Uh, then again, yeah. we only have season one to judge and, by. Yeah, technically, we're not even halfway through it. We still kind of finished stage playoffs, All Star Week. Well, it's been weird so far, in much yeah. the same way that you can look at Tuesday and go, "It's been a weird week." It's been three days. It's still been a mm-hmm. weird week. Oh yeah, I know. But then you have the moment of, "Oh fuck!" It's, it's Tuesday. only Tuesday. Yeah. I say as we record this on a Tuesday. <laughs> anyway, I'm Katie. I'm the support main. I'm CJ. I'm the tank main. You actually did the bit. Well, yeah, because I am a tank man. I will admit that with zero reservation. <laughs> You're humoring me tonight. Yeah. yeah. It, it is a correct statement. <laughs> I will I will make an accurate statement if I see it. <laughs> All righty. Let's get into this past week's results. Yeah. Uh, week five of stage two, the final games to determine the stage playoffs. Uh, and these have shaped up to be really interesting. Yeah. We mentioned last week that if Dallas Fuel wins, they're in the playoffs, and they beat out the Florida Mayhem three to one. I mean, Florida's having a rough stage. Yeah, they went. They they're one of the uh, teams that went zero and seven. Did they go zero and seven? Yes, we have two zero and seven teams. Dang. Yeah, unless I am completely wrong, which I will double check, but I don't think I am. I mean, I definitely knew about the outlaws, yeah. but I yeah yeah. And Justice would have gone 0-7 if not for... Boston being like Chengdu and existing in all tiers of skill at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's Schrodinger's skill tiers. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we both picked Dallas. Yeah. Uh, up next, we uh, another one we were in complete agreement on. Philadelphia Fusion versus the San Francisco Shock. We both picked the orange team. Yes. And the Shock delivered with the 4-0 win... Oh, yeah. Six out of seven of their four, number six out of seven of their four zero wins this yeah. stage, which is fucking lunacy. I mean, they've also had a, I don't want to be like, they've had such an easy stage. They've definitely had some easier matches. I feel like they would not have had this had they gone up against NYXL, Vancouver. Um, yeah. Perhaps had, not, but... But a lot of these were also hard fought, and we'll talk yeah. about the Dragons matchup later. Yeah, the Dragons, despite being another 4-0, that was... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Multiple rounds on maps, and yeah. Mm-hmm. Up next, the Guangzhou Charge versus the Houston Outlaws. I went with Guangzhou, you went with the Outlaws, and Guangzhou takes the 3-2 win. I had so much hope, and we pushed it to a map 5. Yeah. But here we are. I'm not going to lie, it was a little closer than I thought it was going to be. Well, I mean, Outlaws have been having issues, and Guangzhou have shown that this stage that they are not quite the team that we thought they were from stage yeah, one. Yeah, though they are, like, at the they're very tail better. end, they're, like, starting to hit their stride again. I think winning against Atlanta after the world's mm. longest uh, Overwatch match has helped. Yeah. Uh, up next, Boston Uprising versus Gladiators. We both won Gladiators, and we were incorrect. The Boston Uprising takes the 3-1 win over the Gladiators and spoils their perfect season. They were close. Mm -hmm. They were close. See, this this is just, again, Boston Uprising existing in all tiers of skill. You're right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They they can do anything. You never know. They are the masters of the upset, and that doesn't always work out in their favor. Yeah. Uh, The the, uh, next game was Toronto Defiant versus Vancouver Titans, the battle for Canada. Yeah. And, um... Did you the, see Vancouver's art for this? Yes. The hockey face-off? Yes. It was so good. It was. Beautiful art. Yeah. Uh, we both went with Vancouver, and uh, not surprisingly, uh, Vancouver picks up the win. 3-1. Defiant actually yeah. put up a good fight on the, the first... Or which They put up a good fight on one of the maps. I forget which one off the top of my head. Same. But, but they I took think it was one. the first. And at this point, taking a map off Vancouver is kind of a status symbol. Oh, it's true. Although, like, I, I will say it does depend on the context somewhat, because if they're winning 3-0, you, they, they fuck around on the fourth map. Yeah. They'll, t- they'll take the piss. Yeah. You but we've also Hanzo. seen them... Yeah, but we've also seen them... 
win multiple three two maps where they get yeah. pushed to a map five. Yeah, when they need to perform, they do. I'm just saying that when they're doing their victory lap, they get a bit shit posty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Next up, the Shanghai Dragons took the Washington Justice down with a three one win. This was not a surprise given the strength no. of the given the relative strength of both teams. Yeah. We do uh, see the justice starting to improve here, though. Mm-hmm. For sure. Like, the additions of Ark and Sleepy on their back line, like, I harped on it over and over again. The biggest problem that this team had was that their support line was just not at the same level as all the other Overwatch League teams. They weren't you, They weren't getting value out of their ultimates. They were getting picked off. They were panicking in ways, like, that other, the other uh, supports weren't. And now that they've got two people who are really competent, experienced, and can keep themselves alive, make the plays that they need to, you are seeing a marked improvement in this team. Yeah. It'll still take some time for them to, hit, you know, reach their final form, yeah. but we're, we're starting to see it. Like Overwatch League is an anime. They're still working on their underdog story. Yes, exactly. Uh, speaking of underdog stories, uh, we have the Houston Outlaws going up against our Stage 1 champions, the oh, London Spitfire. Good um, London came out to play today. Good London's been out very consistently. Yeah. Um, but uh, Houston gets swept aside 4-0, and that completes their 0-7 and run this stage. You know, I wrote an article the night that this happened mm-hmm. because it was just... Being on Twitter after your team loses is a difficult thing to do. Yeah. Because it's full of the players apologizing and beating up on themselves Mm. and people getting into their mentions and beating up on them, which is not necessary. Stop doing that. Uh, Yeah, I guarantee you nobody is kicking themselves harder than they are. Yeah. The losing team's Twitter saying GG to the other team and then, again, people getting in their mentions and being assholes. Mm -hmm. And then people who just feel the need to be jerks in general. Like, it's very, very hard to be on social media following all the people on your team after they lose. And I wound up writing an article called It's Not Easy Being Green, (laughs) talking about, no, seriously, talking about what to do and how to handle things when your team has a tough stage. Because Mm -hmm. as a Valiant fan and an Outlaws fan, 0-7s back-to-back across my different teams Mm -hmm. is hard to do. And there are still people who, despite the fact that the Valiant are better this stage, I'm not going to stand there and say that they're the same as they were in Mm -hmm. stage four last season, because they're not. But they're doing better, but people still roll out the, oh, well, Valiant are terrible, and this and that and the other. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, guys, it's one of those people still harp on Shanghai for season one, despite the fact that they're a different team. There's literally one person from the original roster still there. Yeah. So it, it, it's and one of none those of the things. coaches, I think. Yeah. Like, I'll link the article, but it's mostly about limiting social media intake and being kind to yourself mm-hmm. in the wake of your team's loss. Get yourself some Ben and Jerry's. Yeah, do Ben and Jerry's. Do something that makes you happy. Mm-hmm. Pick a team to root for in the stage finals, mm-hmm. which I know is tough for a lot of people. It's tough for me. My two are playing each other. Oh, yeah. It just and this this whole paid fan meme where you can't root for more than one team or whatever, and I'm like, no, no, please root for more than mm-hmm. one team. We're, we're all a family here, and if you're the type of person who needs to be rooting for someone, needs to have a stake in an event in order to enjoy it, then pick a team that you think is going to go all the way mm-hmm. and go for it. Yeah. And it can be as simple as which team is geographically closest to me? Which team has a logo that I like? Yeah, like how, how do you think I started rooting for the Outlaws? Well, yeah. They're, they're <laughs> which, out, their which logo team, and color scheme are so good. Which team do I already have their team colors in my wardrobe and I yeah. can put together an outfit easily? Like, it, it doesn't have to be rocket surgery. Just mm-hmm. pick something, mm-hmm. have fun. Stay off of social media if it bothers you, which, you you know, your Mm -hmm. mileage may vary. And just be good to yourself, because it can be difficult. Mm Mm-hmm. Speaking of difficult, we had a very hard-fought battle, the rematch. Uh, Atlanta Rain versus New York Excelsior. We both thought that after the uh, thrashing that New York got at the hands of Atlanta... Uh, that, that New they York would was going to come swing it. Yeah, they were going to come out of the corner with a little fire in them, but they looked scared. Jonak especially. Yeah. And it ended up costing them a uh, 3-2 loss. So far, the only team to beat New York XL in non-playoffs 
is Atlanta Rain, and they've done it twice. This season. This season. Yeah. I'm going to say, yeah, they've done it twice in the same stage. Back to back. They basically came out and went, surprise, bitch. Bet you thought you'd seen the last of me. Again, uh, to go with an MMA reference, it's Garbrandt and Dillashaw. <laughs> it's just one of those, you came to the wrong neighborhood moments, mm-hmm. and then they came back. It's just, how... Yeah. I feel like Atlanta, in beating them once, mm-hmm. got a read on their play style and then just doubled down. Like, we know what they do. We know how mm-hmm. to counter it. Just keep doing it. And I think you're right. I think New York was running scared. I think that they have been cracked at this point. That doesn't make them any less of a top-tier team. Yeah. That doesn't <clears throat> diminish their skill level or their strategy. Mm-hmm. But now... People know how to beat them how to because there's, them. there's footage of Atlanta doing it twice. We still don't really have that in with Vancouver. We have a lot of 3-2 matches mm-hmm. with them that you can take a look at. We've got some close ones, but nobody has managed to over... And, and you, the 4-3 you, you, with a shot. Yeah, you found how to make them bend, but you haven't been able to break them. Yeah, no one's gotten in there quite yet. Yeah. So I'll be interested to see who it is. Because it mm-hmm. will eventually be, just statistically, mm-hmm. it, it will eventually be someone. Yeah. It was almost the shock. It, honestly, it might be them in playoffs this time, considering the form the shock is in. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a very interesting rematch whenever they face each other, provided yeah. that, you know, we don't get a freak upset and one of them gets knocked out early. It's entirely possible. Mm-hmm. This is, is this the first time that Gladiators have been in playoffs at all, or is that just the first time this season? First time this season. Okay. Uh, it's been a while since last season. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of the Titans, uh, they played against the Soul Dynasty. We both thought they were going to win, and they delivered on that with a yeah. 4-0 victory. We thought it was going to be a little more closely fought, but, yeah. like, one thing is, like, I do think Soul continues to look better than they did, and I think we'll continue to see improvement into the... Um, into the next stage, but it they do tend. I, I feel like they're going to have to refine their Zen Goats play a little bit more if they really want to hang with the top teams because they do a lot of somber play and they're good at it. But the problem is that Sombra Goats has a fairly significant weakness, and we've talked we've about talked it before. We've talked about this, No Diva. Yeah. It, no diva, you have a weaker uh, front line, so the moment the Sombra teepees out, you speed boost onto their front line and club them to death. Yeah. And Vancouver is, is really, really good at that. that. Yeah. Vancouver has Bumper, who is yeah. known for clubbing people to death. Yeah, and I almost... In the game. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's, yeah. Um, and I also, also, I also think this was... Um, <laughs> Kind of a stylistic matchup that's interesting to watch uh, between Marvel and Bumper. Because mm-hmm. Bumper is, in the words of uh, Saicho and Bren, mad cunt, big dick, main tank. He is just going insane at all periods of the day. He's coming at you. The call is coming from inside the house. I say, Bumper's I'm here. Sure they didn't and he, say that on Disney XD. Not on Disney XD, <laughs> on Sideshow Stream. Yeah, yeah, that um, would be it. Bumper is in your house and he has an earth shatter. Um, meanwhile, Marvel plays uh, a lot more patiently and carefully. And when I, I this was a, an interesting stress test to kind of see how he reacts to that hyper aggro play. And while I feel like uh, Soul definitely taking this more considered approach has kind of helped to unlock Jay Hong again for, you know, the first time we're, in a we're, while. You're kind of seeing what why people were so hyped about him coming into the Overwatch League yeah. uh, right now. But I think we got to see a chunk of that in season 1 as well. Not not quite to this level, I don't think. I think he's having the best Overwatch League form he's had. True. Um but yeah, uh, they're going to need to really kind of figure out how to handle that level of aggression. Because if you want to compete with the Titans and you want to compete with the Shock, you need an answer for that. Soul's not a... Are they in the finals again? Uh, no. I feel like they just got bumped out for mm. Dallas and the Spark. 
Uh, they did because they lost both of their games this week. Yeah. Um, next game was Chengdu Hunters versus Los Angeles Valiant. And much like the Boston Uprising, Chengdu exists in all skill tiers at the same time. They're in the Hunters zone. And... I am never betting against my boys again when it's winnable. Um, I was, my, my poor hmm. roommate came home while I was in the middle of watching this, like of all days, not to go to the arena. And I'm just yelling at the screen. And I'm like, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to be, she's like, yeah, it's fine. I thought she was going to put her headphones on and just mm-hmm. ignore me. Oh no. She was absolutely listening to me. Get on the point. Get on the point. <laughs> uh, yeah. She has we, a lot of patience. We both thought Chengdu was going to come out on top, but the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that is the Chengdu hunters, uh, has once again defied expectations. And, uh, ended up falling to the Valiant. The Valiant have been improving steadily this whole they, stage. They have. Like it's so easy to say they're still a terrible team and I'm like they're doing better than they were last year. They are stage. improving but they still have a long way to go before they, they can take on the people that the hunters have been able to take on and that's why this is a surprise. They do, but I feel like they're no longer a team that you can just easily discount anymore. I don't... They, they haven't earned that confidence from me just yet. But they're... I'd also say it depends on the match. I'm not yeah. going to bet on them against the Shock, mind you. Yeah, they're trending but, in that direction. But at least to me, they have a way to go before I can... Before I feel like they're going to pose any real difficulty for me in, like, evaluating a matchup. Yeah, the pieces are there. They are steadily improving. And Some they've of the pieces got a, are there. And they've got a two-week break mm-hmm. until the next stage. And I think yeah. that is going to benefit everyone who isn't in the All-Stars game, which mm-hmm. I feel like we should talk about those rosters. I feel like they're hilariously uneven. Well, the other thing is, like, even Pine, when he saw the lineup, like, he retweeted it and was like, wait, what? Yeah. Like, I'm not... Mm. Well, let's let's talk. Anyway, let's, we'll, let's we'll talk about later. that later. We'll talk about that later. We're almost at the yeah. end of this. Next matchup: Toronto Defiant versus Paris Eternal. We thought Paris was going to be able to pull it out, and we thought wrong. Toronto spanks them four zero. I feel like Toronto is one of those teams where I just I never know what to think of them. Yeah, never. They're so inconsistent. Well, right now, especially like oh, yeah. earlier in the um, in the season. They kind of seemed like they had that ability to be there, but right now, like losing Stellar put them in such a weird position and they haven't quite recovered from it. They're still doing that, like, got tagged in a boxing match, shaky leg, newborn deer dance. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, up next, Washington Justice versus Boston Uprising. Jo- the reverse sweep. Boston plays spoiler on themselves. And loses out to Washington 3-2. Well, I think saying Boston plays spoilers on themselves no, I know. does not it's, give justice no, the that's, credit for the that's play true. that they were doing. They they looked really good. They continue to look better each showing, although I will say I do think Boston did not look as good as they normally do. I'm just sad that Kate Mitchell didn't get to watch the whole game. Yeah. She was taken out of the arena with, I think, a dislocated shoulder from what yep. I can piece together. Uh, she said like, as much on Twitter. Like, are you are you okay? Like, I feel bad because this was her last game and her boys won. Mm-hmm. And for those of you who didn't know, she is leaving the Overwatch League because of the ridiculous amount of harassment she's receiving. So mm-hmm. once again, we talk about fans needing to calm the fuck yeah. down. It's the harassment. And, and the other thing she did mention, I believe, was also just the fact that, like, this is a crazy fucking job. Yeah, like, but it's made worse when you can't go yeah. online in any capacity without people, for one, being yeah. horrifyingly misogynistic, and for mm-hmm. another, just tearing you down because you're part of a team that's not doing well. Yeah, it's one of those things where, like, if you're going from, like, running a small independent team, and then suddenly you're in charge of a multi-million dollar franchise that you're expected to, like deliver and then have to deal with things of, you know, the, the rumored budgetary problems and all that. Yeah. That is a difficult enough task on oh, its yeah. own. And then she deals with this entire other dump truck of fucking Misogyny. shit at the same time. Yeah. Um, 
I love her. I'm sorry she's mm-hmm. leaving. I will yeah. continue to follow her and support her in her yeah. endeavors. I'm glad her boys won. Yes. And Sleepy absolutely I'm... ponied up and ordered $100 worth of ice cream from Cold Stone for his teammates. Mm-hmm. It's real easy to get a hundred dollars at Cold Stone, though. Like that's just like, it's tasty as hell, but it is expensive. But like he took he took a picture of his oh, Postmates yeah, he, yeah. receipt, and I'm like, well, you use Postmates, so that's part of your cost issue. Yes. And <laughs> I love Postmates in terms of I want this thing from all the way across town, mm-hmm. and it is way out of my DoorDash radius. Please go get it for me. Mm-hmm. But also, you absolutely pay for it. Yeah. But yeah, he ordered probably, I think there were like 12 or 13 individual Cold Stone things Mm -hmm. like for his teammates and shipped like $92 in ice cream. Mm -hmm. And I just... I love that. It's it's wholesome. Well, and he put his money where his mouth is, quite literally. Yeah. It's like, if we win the stage, I'm buying you all ice cream. And then, oh my God. None of of that uh, waffling dog man did on the bowl cut. Yeah. There was no delay. It was all commitment. No hesitation. Yeah. And the fact that they Didn't that Mika Bren, had ice yeah. cream for him yeah, in the post game interview, that, and, the, and I'm sitting here going, yet another awkward as hell handshake fail in the Aww. proud history of Overwatch League. I love it so failing much. at like basic human interaction in the most entertaining way. And he was, he later tweeted about honestly, I'm amazed I was able to say anything at yeah. all. Like I don't think he was prepared for that in the yeah. slightest. But he he and Ark and Corey have made such a huge difference on that team. Yeah, for sure. And I'm I'm very happy with them. I'm happy to see Sleepy back in action again. Yeah. And just that hug with his shock teammates when he was going mm. off stage and they were there was just so yeah. sweet. Like, all of this was wonderful, unless you're a Boston fan. Yes. Yeah. Um, next match, Shanghai Dragons. <laughs> ver- you're a Boston fan. I mean, I'm a Fusion to an RCK fan. Uh, I, I don't know that I'd call myself a Boston fan. I like... I, that kind of makes you a Boston fan by default right now. True. Mm. True. Mm. Fair enough. I, I like If I'm not rooting for the other team, I'll tend to root for them. Um, Shanghai okay. Dragons versus San Francisco Shock. Shock delivers another 4-0 to complete a 28-0 stage. Holy fuck. They're calling it the Golden Stage. Yeah, I mean... You, you, you can't argue with Just that. Damn. You can't argue with that at yeah. all. Like, they are on a tear the likes of which the Overwatch League has legitimately not seen. This is insane. This I is like be, the uh, McGregor run to fighting Aldo, just in terms of just they call their shot, knock it out of the park, and then just keep moving. And I mean, the Dragons did not give them an easy fight. No. Watching, like, dis- was it Paris that went to like three yeah. rounds? Despite including the shock setting mm-hmm. a record breaking the dragon's record for the fastest attack yes. run on Paris. Mm-hmm. Like insult to injury right there. <laughs> yeah. And and it really was closer than the 4-0 scoreline would yeah. lead you to believe. A lot of these are. Yeah. Um like the outcome I don't think was ever really in doubt. Like there was no moment where it looked like the shock were really like reeling and on the verge of being taken down. But There were some pretty glorious turnarounds on some of those Mm -hmm. fights, though. Yeah, there were. There absolutely were. Like, it it shows off the clutch factor of this team. And I feel like Shanghai, like, we got to see a real... Like, basically, this matchup played out exactly how, like, I would have expected it to. Yeah. Which is Shanghai breaks up the DPS comps, goes for weird angles, and Shock struggles until they find a way to stabilize with their rock-solid 3-3 and forces Shanghai to play into it. Because the thing is, if you're playing Ghosts and you have point control, you have a massive advantage over a team playing a DPS comp because they can't bully you off the point, but you can do it to them. They need to play slow and pick you apart. So eventually... They either need to get really good at dividing and conquering you, or they or they need to swap over. And we kept seeing Shanghai go for these DPS comps and play, you know, put up a good fight with them, uh, win a few fights with them, and then shock eventually win a point or two, but never take the match. Shock eventually forces the three three matchup where they're going to win that. Yeah. Mm Hmm. And that's part of why I think, yeah, last stage's finals was two teams that are incredibly good at 3-3 just going Mm -hmm. at loggerheads. Yeah, pretty much. Because, like, here's the thing. 
there are maps where DPS comps are viable. There are some where DPS comps are even Junker better. Town. Yeah, there are some where DPS comps are even better in some cases. You need to know how to play GOATs well. Yeah. The metagame we live in, it is a default strategy that is going to work in most cases, and unless you can really outplay them, you are at a compositional disadvantage if you're playing DPS into it. It's like dive for season one. You gotta know mm. the meta. Pretty much. As much as I am super tired of goats being the meta, cannot fight the fact that you need to know it. Mm -hmm. And I will say, like, as teams get better, I feel like the fights do get more exciting. They do. They do. But it's still so much more exciting to be like, oh, shit, we got double sniper comp. Oh, we have this. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have pharmacy. Yeah. Oh, the junk rats back out. Like, mm -hmm. part of it is the excitement of getting to see these characters that we haven't seen in a yeah. stage and a half and still don't get to see very often. And just... Goats is a very steady mm -hmm. meta. There's a lot of detail to it, but there's still very much, all right, you got these six characters. This is kind of what we're going to mm -hmm. see. These are the numbers of combinations. Whereas you throw DPS in there, it's chaos. Is the Widowmaker mm -hmm. going to make the shot? Is the tire going to land? Is yeah. I, I feel like there's a lot more turning the fight very quickly potential oh, yeah, for with sure. DPS. And if you look, you need no further proof than looking at Philadelphia because... Carpe cannot deadlift them on Zarya the way that he can on Widow, Widow or Tracer or mm -hmm. things of that nature. And basically, I'll say this about Philly. They have never been a bad team, but they have always been an uneven one. Oh, yeah. They, like, their support line is good but not incredible. Their tank line is good but not incredible. But the thing is, whenever they get into trouble, you have EQO and Carpe who have that ability to pop off in clutch moments and turn fights around completely. But it works better when they're on characters that they are more skilled with. It doesn't work when being... they're on characters they're not skilled with. And not saying that Carpe's bad at Zarya or EQO's bad at Brig, but they are not at the level of, like, Carpe is not on the same level of Zarya as, like, Soimensu or Sinatra. Yeah. He's just a couple steps behind them, no yeah. matter how you cut it. And EQO, he's damn good, but he's not the best. Yeah, and EQO, similar place on Brig. Like, he's not doing the things you see from, like, Erster or Hoxal. Erster's terrifying on Brig, though. Yeah, Erster, and, well, that's why I put him there with Hoxal, who, yeah. for my money, is kind of the best one in the league. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it's there's definitely more that you have to think there's definitely more chance that things will go completely on their heads. And speaking of, well, I can't even use that segue here, but last match, <laughs> Soul Dynasty versus Hangzhou Spark. The Spark takes the 3-1 win and... Uh, My boys in pink! The, yeah, they pulled it out. Yeah. And they uh, cut Soul's hot streak down. Yep. Yeah, so, so and that, punch their it, tickets it to playoff. Them, yeah, yeah, it puts Spark in the finals and Soul out. Mm -hmm. Which is a little sad. Yeah, but... because I feel like Soul had really like improved to the level where they kind of deserve to be there, you know. Yeah, but that's just kind of how things play out sometimes. It's true, and it's I'm so excited that the Spark and the Dragons. Are able mm -hmm. to go. Yeah. Did you see the little the fact art that, we that have Chung two Chinese teams? Yeah. Did you there. see the art that Chung did yeah, for? Yeah. It was basically like waving them off on mm -hmm. a trip. It's so. <laughs> it's cute. the opening scene of Titanic where they're like waving at the ship as it pulls out of port. No, it's like they're getting on a bus. Well, no, I'm saying so I, I know oh, I'm yeah, saying yeah. the the energy of the you know. Yeah, and it was it's it's really cute. I really appreciate. I'm so so happy for this stage that all of these different teams have picked up on the holy shit, people like art thing yeah. and are just sprinting with They're it. They're doing more and more with the social media side of things. Yeah. And like, I know Dallas and Gladiators are doing more like GIF edits and whatnot, mm -hmm. and I love those. Yeah. But I also love the original pieces that we are getting from the Spark who started mm -hmm. it all and just the adorable little style of Chengdu. Yeah. And again, Vancouver gave us this right ridiculously good painting of this mm -hmm. hockey match like holy cow frame that and put it on the wall mm -hmm. and valiant has also started doing this painted art style yeah. like it's it's all been pretty great and i love it mm -hmm. i love seeing this it and i also really like seeing cool. artists get jobs you know pay yeah. your artists pay do your it. artists pay your artists do it 
so yeah, that concludes the games for stage f- uh, two, week five. Yeah. Our final batting average comparison of the stage. I am at 68 correct guesses out of 91 possible for a batting average of 747. I am the fucking plane! <laughs> and Thank you for leaning away yeah, from the mic for that one. I'm sure I still I'm sure our it. audio listeners are I'm, super happy. You did. <laughs> you killed it. You fucking murdered it. Would you look at that? That's just a fucking block. Oh, God That bless. waveform is a square... I wonder um, how many people still listen to us with headphones and how many continue to regret it every week. Mm-hmm. Like, I love you guys. I love you so much. Speakers. Mm-hmm. Speakers are your friends. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> and you are at 63 correct guesses out of a possible 91 for a batting average of .692. Yay! You're still batting. Nice. <laughs> yeah, you're still batting well over 500. Yes, because I don't have to actually hit a ball with any athletic skill. That's why. True. It's a metaphor. Am... Fine, I won't give you a compliment. Like... <laughs> you're not as good as me, but you're still good. <laughs> I am messing with you. You know, I know that, right? I know. All right, all right. Speaking I've had a of... long day. Uh, you and me both, my friend. But speaking of good and great and wonderful, we have Stealing a my word... gimmick. Of you, speaking of eggs. You say that like I haven't been doing segues from day one. True. I'm just saying I feel just every single matchup almost. <laughs> we have enough segues to be an Italian tour group, all right? <laughs> <laughs> what, what are we in Santa Monica? <laughs> Ooh. L.A. jokes. No, I mean, I'm Venice. Actually, not yeah. not Venice Beach, yeah. Venice, Italy. Yeah, I'm just like... The, <laughs> having with, having yeah. witnessed that before, like actual tour groups on segways, that was a thing. I, I have no doubt. Yeah. So that's what I mean by Italian tour group. Tour group in Italy. Anyway, Fred's BS. On the Point is sponsored by Fred's BS. Breads and spreads by Fred. Fred's BS is an L.A. local one-man baked goods business that offers unique flavors in small batches. Whether you're looking for homemade jams, brownies, blondies, or brown sugar buddies, the best cookies you've ever had, Fred's BS can provide. All products are made in small batches with fresh ingredients, nothing is ever frozen, and Fred provides a plethora of flavors that can't be found in stores, like the aforementioned brown sugar buddies or his strawberry peach paradise sunrise jam. Also, if you're L.A. local, you can choose pickup instead of delivery and get your goods even sooner. Head to fredsbs.com and use coupon code on the point for 20% off your entire order. That's fredsbs.com, f r e d s b s.com and coupon code on the point. Fred's BS, treat yourself because you deserve it. And a little bit of other news on the Fred's BS side. He will be doing a site redesign soon. Give me a minute, I am pulling up the date. That's going to be this coming Saturday and Sunday. And then after that, there will be a general sale. Sale codes don't stack with our codes, so use our code instead, because they generally tend to be better than the sale codes, Mm -hmm. hint, hint. And it also supports us. Yeah, it absolutely does. And also, again, if you're local and you do pick up, I have gotten cookies and brownies fresh out of the oven doing that. Uh, Oh, I highly recommend it. So good. I'm going to be doing it for Mother's Day, because my mom's going to be out here. Absolutely. She's coming in tomorrow. Fuck oh me. my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. Order. Do a BS box for your mom. They're mm-hmm. the Fred sampler boxes. You get cookies and brownies and jam. Oh my. Mm-hmm. And they are so damn good. All right. So, uh, first bit of news. For one, they fixed the glitch that Numbani wasn't in the uh, matchmaking rotation for competitive. So, did they make changes in the map itself? Because I heard people talking about the airport being updated, the spawn point. Yeah, it's fixed. It's not like... Or, I don't... It, it, the thing is, I played on it today and I just completely forget. <laughs> um, I... I've, I played on it today in comp and then in a scrim, and I've just completely forgotten. Because people are saying there were changes, and it's like, oh, well, look at this. And I looked at it, and I went, nothing is different? So I don't know. I'll have to go over that with a fine tooth comb. But yeah, for some reason, have um, Nimbani wasn't in the rotation. 
But also, we have a new map live as of today, Havana. I have not gotten to play it yet. Only played it on the on the event. So we can't really talk too much about this. We know it's an escort map. All payload all the time. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, kind of makes sense given how uh, Storm Rising played out. Yeah. Uh, but something we can talk about in a little more detail. The results from Contenders 2019 Season 1. Various something regions. Something you can talk about in a little more detail. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, the results are starting to come in. First off, we have in Contenders NA East, Fusion University securing their fourth consecutive Contenders title. Good lord. They are dominant in this roster, like, despite some changes here and there, has been consistently just incredible. They've just been, like, next level. And the and a lot of these guys are people that I think you're going to be seeing in Overwatch League sooner than later. Like, someone could yeah. pick people up. Like, you've already seen Elk from Fusion University play with uh, the Philadelphia Fusion. They're kind of grooming him for the stage, and he's looked good when he's playing his main role more than, you know, filling in for Boombox. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, this team looks incredible, and this roster just continues to be monstrous. In Contenders NA West, the Dallas Fuels Academy team, Team Envy, went through an undefeated stage and picked up a win. Nice. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, things that relating to them. Yeah. Uh, Contenders South America, we have uh, Low-Key Esports winning out over the rest of the field. Low-Key Esports is a Brazilian super team formed out of players from Brazil Gaming House, which later became uh, base tryhards tri when the players kind of went on their own and formed their own team. Uh, you'd know them as team, pretty much Team Brazil in the World Cup. And LFT OWL who were the basically the winners of Contenders South America Season 1 and 2, respectively. The rosters just kind of merged and formed their own super team. And okay. unsurprisingly, they, they have, won. Uh, they've won again. Contenders Australia winners, order. They clawed their way to the first place finish after finishing second the season before. So pulling a runaway. Yeah. Well, no, you want pulling a runaway. Angry Titans. Angry Titans is the team that's been in the EU scene for so goddamn long, and they've had this runaway-esque run of close yet so far, where they first played in Contenders EU 2018, they finished third, fourth, they finished second in Season 2 and Season 3. They fucking went the distance in back-to-back -back finals and came up that short. And after being so close, they have finally hit that pinnacle. They have won Contenders Europe... Season 1 for 2019. So really pulling a runaway then. <laughs> yeah, legitimately. And honestly, this roster's been so good for so long. Once again, I think we'll see some of that talent in Overwatch League sooner rather than later. And again, we'll talk about this a little more. Um, Contender-specific winners. Talon Esports securing their second, but not second consecutive. They, um, I think it was Season 2, 2018. Uh, and contender specific is what region? Like, what does that encompass? Basically, um, you'll see some players from Thailand, Taiwan, some from China, some from Korea. Basically, it's everything in that region that doesn't fall into Australia or China or Korea. Okay. Um, and then we still have not uh, gotten final results out of Contenders China and Contenders Korea. Their playoffs are still underway and they're going to resume on May 11th, so go watch it. You will be seeing some very high-level play in some of the mo most competitive regions in the world. China especially is going to be interesting because it's fucking weird. Korea is you're just going to see, you know, probably the most competitive single region in Overwatch going at it. I'm wondering what the numbers are going to be for them in North America, mm -hmm. essentially, given that that is also the day of the semifinals for this stage. Yeah. It's like... It'll depend on airing times. It, it will. And Contenders is always somewhat... Um, they don't get the viewership that I feel like they deserve. And part of that's not promoting them well. And part of it's yeah. like... They also don't have the level of the production design that yeah. Overwatch League does. And so going... Because I've, I've watched some contenders off and mm -hmm. on. It's like, I want something on. Is anyone playing Overwatch? Oh, hey, contenders is on. Throw mm -hmm. that up there. It's these teams that I don't recognize, but they're playing. Yeah. But we don't have the same level of 
production. Yeah. I don't want to say you don't have the same level of talent because the shoutcasters are still pretty damn solid oh, yeah. and the desk is still pretty damn solid. Yeah, no, they like... The, the thing is, just not as much money is invested in it. Yeah. And it does kind of show. It's it's the rookie leagues. It is. It's the, it's the triple A's. Yeah. Um, and on this contender's run... Before... Other question. Yeah. Because this came up with this year's World Cup. They have mm-hmm. instituted a minimum age for players of 18. Mm-hmm. Does contenders have a minimum age? Not that I am aware of. So I'm wondering when World Cup rolls around if that is going to hamstring some of our teams and hamstring some of our contender players who will not be 18 by the time the World Cup is there. Because we saw yeah. a lot of players where we love them on the world mm. stage and they weren't able to go directly to league because they were underage, but mm. it was still a great boost well, for yeah, them and for their careers. Yeah, pretty much. And that's there's a lot of examples of it. I don't know that contenders... I don't think they've introduced that rule, but it's possible they did, and I just missed the the information about it. Um, Given that this is a sport where you tend to age out before the age of 25, mm-hmm. instituting a minimum age of 18 for, like, I get it, it, does, it does being kind of, an adult yeah. in the United States, but not having it for the World Cup in previous years and then instituting it mm-hmm. seems a little weird. Yeah, it, uh, it, it is strange, and I kind of won, like, I both understand the rationale behind it, but it, you know, it worked out yeah. fine without you yeah. doing that previously, so what, why now? But Because it's in the United States and something, something, legal, adulthood, United States. Like, I, I get mm-hmm. trying to avoid legal ramifications, yeah. especially for a company as large as Blizzard and an event as large as BlizzCon, where, let's be real, people go out afterwards and party like crazy. Yep. Um... And that the supposedly the entirety of the World Cup is going to be at BlizzCon, not just mm-hmm. the finals. Yeah, which so is that's gonna be bonkers. I really don't like that as a decision. I don't know how they're gonna do that, and it sucks for people watching in other countries because it's like, well, we didn't see like the European ones for World yeah. Cup because it started at one a.m. and, and the... I was already in bed. But it's great for people in Europe who have to stay up till fuck o'clock to watch the Overwatch League. Yeah. You know, it, I, I really don't like it because also the crowds that you got in each of these sort of like home venue qualifiers were really loud and energetic. They were into it. They were happy to be there. And it yeah. let you, it gave you a whole bunch of good Overwatch content with enthusiastic crowds, especially the crowd in Paris. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like you, by scaling it down like this, you rob it of some of it, of some of the you know, the the majesty of it, really. My two theories for that. One, Money. those lay well, those layoffs at Blizzard. I wonder if a lot of it wasn't travel staff and whatnot. And two, money, less we don't have the budget for the World Cup and more we don't we're in, want to. We're investing it in everyone having their own home games for Overwatch League for season three. Well, I I that, don't know how much Blizzard's putting into that. I don't know either. But I wouldn't be surprised if it was a chunk of change. Honestly, I think... Because it... Blizzard would also have to cover room, board, travel, etc. for their hosts. Not for the teams, mm-hmm. but for their hosts. Yeah, it's... For their, shout, for their shoutcasters, for the desk, for the production. Oh, yeah, for... no, like, there's definitely, yeah. like, a lot of hurdles to jump. But I... I don't know. I still don't like it. I think it's a decision that kind of cheapens the World Cup a bit. I agree. When you hold the whole thing in the United States, but it's supposed to be the World Cup, like, come on, guys. You Mm -hmm. hold the finals at BlizzCon because it's fucking BlizzCon. Yeah. But why would you not put them in other places where people who never get a chance to do this get to see their home teams Mm -hmm. play? Yeah. Like, I I don't... It just makes it less special. I don't think it's that Blizzard doesn't have the money because that would be wild. They don't want to spend it. It's that they've allocated it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which makes me wonder what else is going to be happening at BlizzCon. Mm -hmm. Because last year's BlizzCon didn't have a lot of announcements, so I would imagine they were saving a lot for this year. (laughs) New Overwatch mobile game. (laughs) Would you be surprised? Not really, but I just... Fucking Hearthstone I was, gets played more than anything else yeah. because it's a mobile game and people go and play it during their five-minute well, break on the toilet. I am mostly referring to the Diablo mobile game's yeah. incredibly frigid reception. Because it was one of the only things they had to show. Well... It was not... It was also... It, mm, 
I just the dude getting up in the Q and A line. Um, <clears throat> is this a joke? Oh Jesus! Yeah, no, that happened. Oh um, my God! No, I was just watching the World Cup all weekend, and also Darren DePaul. Yes, I I I was very happy to get to see his panels live. Um, anyway, speaking of World Cup and things relating to it, Trill. We know him from playing in Team Australia, and he plays for uh, Team Envy, as we mentioned, the uh, winners of Contenders NA West. Or should I say he played for them until recently? Until like two hours ago. Yes. Trill has been called up and is joining the Dallas Fuel main roster. Mm, this should be fun. It should be. Like, Trill is awesome. Really, really talented player who just has made a name for himself in pretty much every team environment he's been in. And I'm interested to see how he fits in, considering what a big part of the Dallas Fuel OG is. Yeah, it's the same role. So is would he main be tank. a backup main tank, maybe? He, yeah, would he could be... be a backup. He could be, you know, something like they initially used Marvel for in Seoul, like earlier in the season, where he, they had their, like... B team lineup that specialized on certain maps or points. Could um, be. It's possible, but I'm not sure. Like I think it, I, it's kind of impossible to say until they show it. Really, just considering again what a big part of the roster OG is. But in any way, it's really cool to see someone get to complete the the path to pro that you know you hear so much about. Yeah. Get to the Overwatch League stage, and also it's cool to have another Aussie up there. Because they have, I remember when Team Australia actually made it to the final rounds for yeah. World Cup and were in America and people were saying, hey, can they maybe redo their tryouts for Overwatch League now that they're not on shitty internet? Yes. Like, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. That'd be great. Give them an actual fighting chance because mm-hmm. Australia is notorious for terrible, terrible internet. Mm-hmm. So, among other things, you know. Yeah. But... Snakes and sharks and spiders and kangaroos and... Yeah, but you don't get a lot of those in esports. So, I mean... Yeah, just in terms of, like, esports and online mm-hmm. presence, Australia is known for having terrible internet. So having Team Australia in the U.S., where depending on your geographic location, you can get good internet, mm-hmm. and Anaheim is a good internet place. It yes. has to be. Again, the whole <coughs> let them try out again now that they have actual good internet, because that mm-hmm. lag will kill you. Oh, yeah. Uh, for sure. I will say, though, this does open up an interesting um, kind of can of worms in that Trill is our first post-stage pickup. First new addition to a roster that's going on uh, after the Stage 2 has wrapped. Do you think other teams are going to kind of make some similar moves? Are there going to be call-ups? Are there going to be some roster shuffles? Because there are some... There are definitely some teams that are sorely in need of some additions. Houston. Uh. Houston, (laughs) uh, honestly, the one that jumps out to my mind is Paris. Like, don't get me wrong, they have a lot of talent on that roster, but it's not clicking. And also... They're kind of in a rut. They are in a rut. But also, if you look at just the top teams in Europe right now, Angry Titans, British Hurricane, uh, Team Giganti, they are playing at such a ridiculously high level. And it does make you wonder, like, is the talent you're seeing on stage really 100% the best that Europe can put forward? Can they bring up a few more people and shuffle things around to maybe start getting the performance that they're hoping? I honestly think that they could. And I, excuse me, it's been one of those days. I saw, again, back on my favorite team, the Outlaws. Uh, I have many favorite teams. They are one of them. My good, good boys. I've seen discussion about, just from fans and from my favorite esport writer, Ms. Liz, and that's Mm. not sarcasm. She really is. About potential changes that they could make. And Mm. it is a lot of ditch the coaching staff. Because when you go O and 7, that kind of tends to be what happens. Well, when you go O and everything, regardless of sport. That tends to be what happens, Um, except for in some collegiate sports, but (laughs) Air Force. Uh, (laughs) I lived through the Fisher DeBerry years. Those were not easy. I don't know what that means. Uh, We only ever ran the option, the football team. We only ever ran the option. So all our other opposing teams had to learn were three plays. 
because that was all we did. It was Mm. bad. We had a lot of really talented people, but not great coaching. Yeah. So anyway, the outlaws. uh, (laughs) Well, again, part of it Mm. is coaching staff. Get someone new. Get a new head. Get a new assistant. Just bring in new blood there. They do need more support staff. Letting go of or selling the contracts of one of their larger name players in order to bring in players who can fill the roles that they need. Mm -hmm. If Spree or Muma or Jake or Rockus or whoever want to go somewhere or if another team wants to pick them up. And if the Outlaws are having financial issues, which is one of the going theories, given that their parent company is being sold right now. Yeah, they're... The the situation with Optic Gaming is really complicated and weird. Yeah. And it's only getting weirder because yeah. Immortals, which is the parent company for the Valiant, the Valiant, bid on them. Yeah. And the thing is, you there there's laws against dual again well not laws, but you know, league bylaws Maybe or don't. whatever. Yeah. About like dual ownership and all that. But it's the thing is Houston continues to be this perfect storm of just bad things for this team and this org Mm -hmm. because you have these issues with the parent company and the ownership group that can really hurt your chances of getting the support you need to be successful. Oh, yeah. You've got a very small coaching staff. You have a roster that is good at what they do but is very inflexible beyond that. So the yeah. second certain players come in, you know exactly what's what, going what's to be happening. Oh, Linkser's coming in. We're going to get some sniper play and some DPS. Yeah, we've got a possibility of snipers. If Coolmat's coming in, well, they're just going to run goats the whole way. Don't really worry about it. If Dante's in, somber can happen. Um, yeah, it's just... they Their roster's very predictable. And the other thing that I was listening to... Um, Oversight, which um, normally I don't really go for it, but I was interested because they had Gunba, who's uh, one of the coaches for Boston, who also ah. used to be uh, a coach for Valiant, actually. Yeah. Um, he was talking about Houston at one point and said that Ty Rong, who's the head coach of the Houston Outlaws, it's an interesting thing because Ty Rong is almost more accomplished than a lot of the players on Houston. Which is one of those things of like, I, it kind of made me stop and go, huh. Because if you look at the teams that uh, these players came from, a lot of them didn't really have super impressive results as well. Hmm. And it starts to make me wonder a little bit as well if this roster might not just be plain underpowered in uh, in certain key capacities. And which, I mean, we saw the Justice bring yeah. in Ark and Sleepy, yeah. which was basically the shot of adrenaline that they oh, needed. Yeah. And the Outlaws have a lot of, they've got a lot of really big names. Yeah. Again, Jake and Muma and Linkser mm-hmm. and Rockus And like, these are names that people know. These are personalities yeah. that people resonate with. Yeah. And it's part of why Houston fans. has They have such a large so and passionate fan base. Yeah. Doesn't explain why people like to shit on them, but I think, again, that's because a lot of Houston fans are women and people are assholes. There um, are some other reasons, but that's definitely a huge one. Yeah. there, and I mean, every team has fans that are terrible. That's yeah. that's a given for any sport. Um, mm. Unless you're a Patriot fan where they're all terrible. No, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm joking. It's low-hanging fruit. I'm kidding. I'm from New York. You don't have to fucking <laughs> justify Boston Patriot to me. I wasn't, I wasn't me. apologizing to you. I, I know. Uh, I'm just... I, <laughs> I know, I know. It's like, I'm a Broncos fan. I will go after Raiders fans mm-hmm. all day long. But at the end of the day, I live with one. Yeah. So, you know, your sports fandom is not the be-all and end-all of your identity. Yeah. Anyway, so as much as it would suck to break up the family, because that's kind of what it would be at this point, mm-hmm. because we know all these personalities and how they work together and all that, it would probably behoove the organization to say, yeah, we're trading Rockus, but we're getting this player and this player. And, oh, mm-hmm. that fills in a gap where this. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like the one person they could not get away with trading is Jake. Because he's such yeah. a backbone for their team. And you can see that they don't, they're not nearly as cohesive when he's not on stage shot calling. Yeah, Like, I feel like he is the one person on that team where you need to keep him because he makes things function 
in so much as they ever do on the Outlaws. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's hard to say because Jake does provide a lot of in-game coordination for the team and is one of the you know in-game leaders for them. But, but he's not great on this meta. Not on this meta, and also his hero pool's kind of inconsistent and weird. It is. Um, but again, just in terms of coordination, yeah, we've seen teams with really good talent and no coordination fall apart. I, I point you to the Valiant last season, yeah, and for a last stage rather, and for a chunk of this stage, like yeah. you can have all the talent in the world, but if you have no coordination, you're hosed. Yeah, and I feel like maybe not in this meta. But the level of coordination that Jake is able to bring to the outlaws with the shot oh, calling it, and the decision making yeah. makes up for a smaller hero pool. It, it definitely does uh, give the team something. And in this meta more than most, I think your ability to cohesively play as a team is massively important. Yeah. But the thing is, you need people who can play the parts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's where a lot of teams are yeah. having trouble. Because, again, you've got DPS on off tanks and whatnot and DPS on Brigitte. And Brigitte does not play like a DPS. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, we Valiant's having this trouble. I want to say that, like, Fusion's having this trouble to an extent. Well, Fusion has a number of issues uh, regarding that. Yeah. But that's definitely one of them. There's, you can, the teams that are doing better in this meta are the teams where their DPS was able to move onto the Brigitte and onto mm -hmm. the Zarya yeah. without issue. And, in some and the teams that are having trouble are the teams where they have a weaker Zarya or a weaker Brigitte because yeah. their players aren't accustomed to that. Yeah, and I think that that's a big problem is that the Valiant coaching staff has not been able to teach their players these new roles. Yeah, we, we need to get... I love Agilities. I love him so much. He's wonderful. He is a good human being. I quite like him. God damn, he is not a solid Brigitte. We no. If they're going to recruit someone, especially in this meta, we need a Brigitte player. And I know mm. that's going to kill Agility's playtime. And I don't want to get rid of him by any stretch of the imagination, mm -hmm. especially when we have Junkertown in rotation yeah. and more DPS maps coming back. But, but sometimes... you got to play the meta. Sometimes teams require... A, an addition or a roster shuffle to really maximize their potential. And we've seen that in a number of teams in Overwatch League. Look Shock at, let Sleepy go. And yeah. they wanted to keep him, but he was not as good well, a fit I was gonna in the say meta as even, Violet. I was going to even say look at uh, Shock early this season because they had a rocky start despite how strong they are now. Mm -hmm. But they settled on their roster. They made sure that everyone knows what they need to do. And they're killing it. Yeah. Like, they're terrifying. Yeah. They're, are they our, they're they're number, our top seed? They are number state. one seed, yeah. Yeah. And then Vancouver, because Shock has not dropped any matches, any maps, rather, and mm -hmm. Vancouver has dropped some. Yes. Has dropped a number. <laughs> some. A number yeah. greater than zero. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, the, it, this is going to be interesting to see what teams do to kind of adjust, because... Val, I, I'm looking especially at Outlaws, Valiant, and Paris for this. Because Not the Mayhem. Here's the thing. Mayhem has made a decision on how to improve their roster, and have they've picked a direction, they're moving in it, and despite the fact that they still ended up 0-7, they turned in good performances. The roster doesn't look as scattershot as they did. They don't look hopeless. And I think that maybe with a couple additions and all that, maybe a couple additions here and there, they could really become something with what they have now. They have made a move to improve. Likewise, <laughs> the... <laughs> likewise... That rhymes. The Justice have picked up Ark and Sleepy to address their backline problems. Valiant still has weaknesses that need to be filled. Yes. Houston still has some major weaknesses that need to be filled. Yes. And uh, Paris... Clearly still has some issues. Um, those three teams are the ones that really need to be looking at what they're doing right now and what they can be doing differently, whether it's picking up people, whether it's just, you know, shuffling people around and doing lineups, whether it's new coaching staff. They need to really look at what they want to do if they want to have any shot at 
playoffs right now or success in season three to a certain extent because outlaws is right now at the point outlaws mayhem and justice are pretty much at the point where unless they go on you know shock-esque tears they are mathematically ineligible ineligible yeah they, they would, would have to run perfects and i'd say the valiant they need are to, they need the to win like 75 percent of their remaining maps I'd say the Valiant are not quite at that point, but they're pretty goddamn close. Yeah, they're getting there. Yeah. Um, it's just... Actually, I think they are as well. But where basically they're almost as far out as they can be. Yeah. You need to change something. The formula isn't working, and you need to really start taking a hard, honest look if you want to find the success that you are trying to give your organization and your fans and your players. I'm wondering how much of this is trying to find the right words for this. Like when it comes to larger sports, when it comes to baseball, when it comes to football, when Mm -hmm. it comes to whatever, like you know a handful of players, but you don't know all of them as intimately as you know a lot of the players on your Overwatch well, you League team of have, choice. They're also, smaller. They have more social media presence. That was, yeah. And then, well, like, a lot of individual pro athletes also have uh, social media presence. But they don't do a lot of... They don't, I'm thinking of, like, mm-hmm. the Mayhem Try Girl Scout cookies yeah. and gamer snacks for the Valiant and Custom News Network God. and just... All of this really good content Mm -hmm. that they put out on the social side to the point where that's why I referred to selling the contracts for any of the Houston players as breaking up the family. You know these people, you know them as a unit. And I wonder how much of not wanting to make roster changes comes from the idea of they're a unit, they're a family. Mm -hmm. If we lose this person, do we lose their money-making potential? Do we lose the fans that have hitched their star to this particular player? Because if you look at Dallas in Season 1, XQC and NVS's existing fan base brought a lot of attention to them. Yeah. DeFran in Season 2 for Atlanta helped to really kickstart Atlanta's presence and fan base. Yeah. Star power is important, especially because Overwatch League is so young. Yep. They haven't had time to really develop the deep roots that traditional sports teams have in their home cities. Because we have sports teams dating back to the 20s and 30s. Some even further. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, Yankees. it's... Yes. <laughs> Yankees. Yes. Um, but my, my point is that that star power... In a young team's life, the star power and the level of success they can find are the two things that really can start to cement a team's identity. And you don't necessarily want to lose some of what you've built in that regard. Because, I mean, again, talking about, because Valiant is the one that I follow the most, obviously, doing gamer snacks with Kareev and Agilities. It's hysterical. It's these really cute little videos does that put pressure on them not to trade agilities for someone else who better fits the mm-hmm. meta? And I keep picking on agilities. And like I said, I don't want him to leave. I like him. I named a cat after him. Yeah. Look. Although, like, to be fair, it's an inter- It's a talking point people have kind of discussed. Yeah. Because I, I wonder if that isn't hamstringing Houston as well. Like, Muma pulls in a ton of people for being one of the only mm. out LGBT players in the league. And I've seen talk about, like, there are a lot more LGBT players in the league. They're closeted because of bigotry, Mm -hmm. because et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Effect came out as bisexual. Like, and he's not playing right now. And hopefully, you know, leaving the professional competitive environment has been, you know, good for his mental health. Um, But, yeah, it's there. I'm just using it as as an example of there are more of them out there that you don't necessarily know about. But Muma Um, is the big one that we've known about forever. Yeah. And so Outlaw is like, what if you could get someone who works with the meta a little better, but you would need to trade Muma for them? Do you you do you lose a lot of your LGBT fans because they're going to follow Muma because that's visible representation Mm -hmm. for them? For Shanghai, like we keep Gregory, she's a wonderful off tank and I love her, Mm -hmm. but She's the only female player Mm -hmm. in the league, which, again, is something where I want to go flip a fucking table. Yeah. 
You're going to bring someone up from contenders? Start bringing up some women, huh? They're all super talented. They are. We need more women in the league. Come Agreed. the fuck on. We, we also need more women in contenders. Yeah, there we need more women in professional gaming. And to that end, people need to stop being assholes to women in professional gaming. And that is a whole Just gaming other topic. In, gaming in general. Well, because yes, gaming one in kind general. Of, Leads to the other, kind of like a series of little, you know, locking yeah. gates on a, on I a mean, dam. I mean, Aspen did a commercial for, I can't even remember, the car brand. And people were bitching about, oh, she's not a professional gamer. And I'm like, she's a Twitch streamer. She gets paid she gets, to play games. She gets, Therefore, yeah. she's a professional. She gets paid to play Overwatch, which is a game, on her Twitch she's stream, also... which makes her a professional Fuck off. She's also signed to one of the largest esports organizations on the planet as a streamer. So she gets a salary for it, too, I assume. Uh, I don't know the contract details, but yeah, she's professional. Yeah. She's legit. She's probably better than you. Oh, I'm sure she is. Yeah. And there's just so many people getting so mad about, well, she's not a professional gamer. And I'm like, I assume that you aren't either mm. in any capacity. So it's just, it's that sort of toxic backlash that makes women who are talent, mm. more than talented enough to make the cut, not want to go for mm. it because it's not worth the strike on their mental health. Yeah. Again, reasons that Kate is leaving the justice. Yep. It's, it's not okay. And it's not one of those can't perform under pressure things. It's one of those, the pressure is doubled at least and mm -hmm. horrifyingly toxic and often comes with threats of rape and death mm -hmm. just because you're a woman in what is perceived to be a man's world. Mm -hmm. So stop that. Yes. If you, all good on you if you're not doing that. If you see someone doing that, call them on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, stop that. And teams start taking a long, hard look at what you are doing. Yeah. But again, going back to Shanghai as Gregory, she's the only woman in the mm -hmm. league. How many fans, how many supporters do they lose if they trade her, despite the fact that she hasn't been getting nearly as much play this stage? Yeah. Like, I think that the social currency is something that needs to be considered. And I oh, think 100%. that is hamstringing teams who would otherwise gladly be trading these players to places where the tra where the players will fit better and so that they can get players that mm -hmm. will fit better in their lineups. Yeah. And I mean, again, we saw this with Sleepy. They didn't want to let him go, but they wanted him to be able to play. Yeah. And there was a place for him on the Justice. And obviously he's doing well on the Justice yeah. and the Justice is starting to turn it around. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's I, I would love to see a study on social currency versus talent and monetary currency in terms of trading decisions in the Overwatch League. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it doesn't help that the organizations as they exist right now are very small. Yeah. Like, it's not one of those things where you can have a sports team and players get traded and all that, and while it might suck, while it might kind of change a team's identity for a year or two, it's... A year or two in the life of a much larger organizational history. We will always remember the Elway years in the same way that we will always remember the Tebow years. <laughs> like, Pretty well, much. Yeah. Like, it's not one of those... It's not one of those things where, like... As big a thing, just to go to the Yankees example again, as much as Jeter was a part of, like, what the Yankees were for such a long time... There were stars before him. There will be stars after him because the Yankees are the Yankees. We don't know if Overwatch League has that staying power yet. Yeah. We don't know if the teams have fostered a connection that deep in a large enough way. And I think that moving the teams to do, everyone's going to be playing at home. Everyone's oh, going to have help. a place where they play. I think it'll help, but I also think it's a gamble. Like, oh, for sure. There's a lot of money well. going into it. And then you've got to worry about getting at least a relatively consistent audience. I think looking at the homestand weekends helps. Oh, and yeah. I think the homestand weekends are definitely like, well, we're going to try this. Oh, yeah, it's and definitely a And I say this as someone who has signed up for the receive emails to let you know when tickets for the Valiant homestand mm -hmm. weekend go on sale thing probably three separate times because they yeah. keep advertising it. And I'm like, is there new information? No, but I'd better make sure I'm signed up. So I yeah. think I'm on that list multiple times. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm not the only one. No, and I not. live in L.A. and I can see them whenever I want to trundle down to the Blizzard Arena. So, mm -hmm. like... And then when they move, 
it's also going to break the culture of the Blizzard Arena, yeah. which I will miss. Oh, God, yeah. So much. Well. We'll worry about that later. That's a ways off. And that a is lot closer. future all of our problems. A lot closer is the stage finals. It is. And our matchups. First off, the Shanghai Dragons versus the San Francisco Shock. I mean, come on. I, I yeah. It's I gotta, a rematch. Yeah. This is hysterical to me. Yeah. But I'm definitely going with the shock because because of the shock. I yeah. would not I would not be surprised to see another 4-0, but I am sure that Shanghai will come out swinging, especially mm. since them losing all them being 4-0'd here gave them a shock their golden stage. Yeah, and I'm sure that the dragons are looking at that footage very closely and I'm sure that they're learning a lot about why certain things worked in that game and why they didn't, but they need to make a lot more adjust adjustments to basically overturn that result in this rematch than the shock do in order to keep it because they were that couple steps ahead in terms of their cohesion and their ability to play the meta. And I'm sure the Shock will also be studying that oh, footage yeah. quite a bit, too. Oh, yeah. Like, all right, this is what they like to do. This is how they play these comps. Here's how we make this work. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And based on where they stand right now, I don't... I could see the Shanghai Dragons taking a map. Maybe even two if the stars align. But there, I view that as somewhat as pretty unlikely, and I don't think they're getting the win. Yeah. I'm putting it on the Shock as well. Yeah. Up next, the Hangzhou Spark versus the London Spitfire. As much as I want to say Spark, I would love to see Spark go far. Mm -hmm. I do think it's going to be Spitfire, just because of the way they've been showing up. Yeah, if they can continue that form, it's going to be really, really good for them. Like, if good Spitfire shows up, the, sh the Spark don't have a chance. If bad Spitfire shows up, the Spark might take it. Well, the thing is, the Spark have been leveling up a little bit, but they've oh, yeah. had a relatively e easy strength of schedule. Yeah. And they've, qu I don't want to say quietly put together a win streak because people are excited about them, but yeah. they've amassed a good record without a tremendous amount of fanfare about, you know, matchups or wins and that. Yeah. And we know them for their art. Th this is going to be them getting put through their paces. Oh, yeah. And we'll see how far they've come, but London right now is looking like they're, again, just a couple steps ahead. Yeah. Up next, and this is the one that's really interesting to me because I think this is kind of the toss-up, uh, just given the recent results for both teams, New York Excelsior versus Los Angeles Gladiators. I think if we see an upset, we'll see it here. Because yeah. I know, I would imagine... That people will once again peg it on New York to win it all, despite what we mm -hmm. saw last stage. Because people just... It's one of those things where people keep ragging on Shanghai because of last season. Mm -hmm. People keep coming back to New York because of last season. Well, to be fair, they're also 12-2. and two. Yeah, like, they're also damn good this season. Yeah. I'm not discounting that. But in terms of who's the better team, you will still have people picking New York over San Francisco, because again, look at last season, or over Vancouver Titans, because they've only had the one season. Mm -hmm. There is still people who will look at last season's pedigree and apply it to this season, whether it fits or not. Mm -hmm. So I think that New York will have a lot of backing because of that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll have as many people picking them to win it all. Mm -hmm. But honestly... If New York is having issues with aggressive play style and Atlanta was able to figure that out, I think Gladiators, with their aggressive play style, have a very good chance of taking New York. And I'm going to put it on Gladiators for this one. Honestly, I might as well, just because here's the thing. We've seen what Atlanta did to beat New York. and twice. To do it twice. Gladiators coaching staff has sh consistently shown themselves to be really adaptable, really good at breaking down a strategy, really good at coming up with inventive plays, and just generally being, making sure that their team is super well prepared for the opponent that they are facing. Excel is going to have to plug those holes. Now, this is far from a sure thing for Gladiators, because one, the quality of the New York Excelsior, and two, Gladiators are coming off a loss to Boston, which... yeah. You know, that's something that the NYXL can take a look at as well to try and find, you know, things that they can exploit. This is a really, really close one for those reasons. And it's also seeds four and five. Yeah, and it's seeds four and five. I do give the Gladiators a slight edge. Slight. I'm biased. I am biased 
and it's close enough that that bias is enough to push me over. Yeah. Gladiators. And for me, it just comes down to the fact that Gladiators coaching staff has been really good at helping their players exploit weaknesses in other teams. And as much as we miss Fisher, adding Roar and Decay was yeah. such a great Roar, roster move. I I told you at the start of this podcast. I, told I didn't you. know who they were. Yes. <laughs> Um, and finally, your own personal civil war, the battle of mm, the blue, the Dallas fuel versus the Vancouver Titans. Absolutely. The Titans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Well, again, I'm happy to see either one of these teams move forward and I'm not as happy that they're playing each other this soon. Um, Vancouver Titans. No soon's on Paris. (laughs) Vancouver (laughs) has been consistently that step ahead and I feel like Dallas has struggled with teams that take the initiation away from them and Titans are really really good at that. I feel like Dallas's coaching staff is working night and day to try and figure out a way to beat them and I'm sure that they've come up with game plans but the clutch just the level of individual skill, the level of cohesion and the clutch factor that the that the um, Titans have, I would be very surprised if the Fuel uh, were able to win this. And I say this is someone I mean, who it's really also likes the, both teams. But it's also the Titans and just looking at That's literally what I just said. Yep, yep. <laughs> surprised that the Fuel could win this. Like, mm, and the sun is slightly warm. I wouldn't be surprised if the Fuel took a map or two, mm-hmm. but I don't think they'll take a the match. I think we'll see them in a better state than the last time they played. Yeah. I do think that calling what the seeds are going to be after this is a little complicated. And again, one For upset sure. can throw everything. Yeah, but most but, likely it means that we're going to see the San Francisco Shock taking on the New York Excelsior and the Titans versus the Spitfire. Or the Shock well, versus yeah. the Gladiators. Yeah, bas- and we're going to wind up with another California but, yeah, fight. Yeah, basically San Francisco is going to be playing either New York or Gladiators, provided Spark and Dallas don't do a big upset. Meanwhile, uh, Titans is going to be most likely playing Spitfire. Yeah. So at the end of it, we might be looking at Shock and Titans again. For sure. And I will say it'll be very interesting for me. And I kind of like I'm excited to see the possible matchup between London Spitfire and Vancouver Titans because it's another like old school Overwatch rematch because London Spitfire, their core is a team called, well, was a team called GC Busan. Yes. They beat out Runaway in the finals of Apex Season 4. And again, different iteration of Runaway with a different lineup of players. A lot of holdovers. But basically, there's history there. And yeah. the, it will be interesting to me to see this rematch a year and a half down the line. And again, we... What we were expecting from last stage's title match, we were expecting New York Excelsior and Vancouver Titans. Mm -hmm. And the only way for us to get that match up this time around is for New York Excelsior not only to beat the Gladiators, but then to also beat the Shock. Yep. Assuming the Dragons don't, which I feel like is a fairly safe assumption at this Mm -hmm. point. And I don't think the Excelsior can do it. I yeah. mean, I put it down on Gladiators, but even if they beat the Gladiators, I don't think they're getting past the Shock. Yeah. Because, again, Excelsior has shown that they have issues with extremely aggressive play. Mm-hmm. And San Francisco has shown that they are well, good at that it, shit. It's not just aggression. It's being able to apply pressure to the correct targets. And given how NYXL plays, that isn't always easy. Yeah. Um, it's but, being able I mean, to exploit Mono and Jonak. Yeah. I feel like take down Jonak at this point. It's one of those, yeah, he's the best Zenyatta in the league. Obviously take him down. Like, it's one of those no-brainer yeah, things, but, but also, it's also an easier said than done He thing. is guarded like an Arabian prince. Oh, like, absolutely. It's it's not easy to do. But so Atlanta, Atlanta just burned the whole damn house down. Atlanta may have uh, given a blueprint for people to follow. So we will see how that goes. And I'm very excited to watch these games. I do think it's going to come down to Shock versus Titans. Yeah. And if we wind up with that rematch, I'm going to put it on the Shock. It's one of those things where it's entirely possible that it swings either way. And it's close enough that I will actually go with the hard vote and go Titans. All right. Yeah. 
I mean, usually picking Titans as the winner of a match is kind of well, yeah. the easy thing to but do. In, but in this case, we're seeing two teams that have had history. They have got, they have had wars with each other at this point. Yeah. And they they know what to do against each other. And it's just a matter of who can execute that game plan better and who can adapt better to what happened. Because if you look at their last game... They the it was decided by little mistakes made by you know the teams and then by their ability to adapt to the plays that were being thrown at them. And they're both good at that. They're both really good at that. So yeah, I'd I would love to see a rematch. And that's not something I usually mm-hmm. say, like, all right, we saw this for last stage finals, let's get some new teams. No, last stage finals was so ridiculously exciting. Yes. And coming down to the last map. Of a mm-hmm. seven map series. Like, that's crazy. Give me more of that. Mm-hmm. I want to see it again. Give me the rematch for this. And also, coming down to that last map and then having that dramatic reversal of the fastest Rialto time ever. Mm-hmm. Like, you, it, it's one of those things that's so scripted. Like, you. Or, Overwatch League is an anime. Not Yeah, it's l- not so scripted, but it's one of those things that you couldn't have. You couldn't scripted have written it, it better. For more dramatic turns. Yeah. Yeah, Overwatch League is an anime. And I, depending on who your protagonist is, changes what the story Speaking is. Speaking of which, uh, there's a dude on Twitter, the post was put on Reddit, of Overwatch League Academia. Just go watch it. Oh my god. No, I saw that. Yeah, d- did you see the second one? I don't know. Well, we, we will fix that. Oh shit, more things to put in the links below. Yeah. Um, Speaking of Twitter posts, the one that I saw earlier today from Manic who says that he is an Overwatch player and coach, but doesn't say with whom, so I'm not sure. But he tweeted, Overwatch League 2019, stage three strength of schedule for each team, easiest to hardest. Mm -hmm. And the three easiest, just in terms of, like, we have straight numbers here, not who's playing who. The easiest ones are Guangzhou Charge, San Francisco Shock, and Shanghai Dragons. And the one with the three hardest stage are Valiant, Dallas, and gladiators. Mm-hmm. And I saw this because I follow several members of the gladiators front line and I just saw the replies of crying and gladiators and I'm like, yeah, I'm crying in green and purple here. Yeah. This is going to be hard. Yeah. And we'll get into this more, you know, going forward, but the strength of schedule does make things interesting. And I think that's been a he- and, and also the fact that we have so many more teams and therefore teams are playing fewer matches. Yeah. You wind up with a lot more all win or all loss stages. Yeah. For whereas having an all loss or an all win stage was incredibly rare for the first season. Yes. Unless you were the Shanghai Dragons. Yeah, in which, which case. Ouch, yeah. but true. Whereas here, it's, well, oh my god, we went 0-7. Yeah. And, and I'm like, well, you're not the only ones, and it's not the first time. So mm-hmm. it's it just makes it far more likely. Yeah. To the point where I feel like once people get used to that, it's not going to be as much of a, oh no, you were terrible. It's, yeah, you faced the Titans twice this stage. Mm-hmm. Like, hmm. Yeah, it's one of those things where you do have to look at the results a little more closely to really get a picture of where things are at. In the same way you look at a 4-0 and go, yeah, it's a 4-0, but these were all incredibly hard fought, and Mm -hmm. some of them went to two or three rounds. Yeah. Like, the numbers don't say everything. Mm -hmm. There's so much more story context to this. Yes. Hence, Overwatch League is an anime. Mm -hmm. I know people hate that, but I love it so, so much because it's so, so true. With all of these ridiculous storylines, it is a sports anime. It's true. It's true. And yeah, that's yeah. that's all I got to say. Do you have your Reddit thread up so we can do a last minute check to see if we've missed anything? Nope, we're going to make that happen. Yeah, because I three hours ago, the Valiant tweeted this, you know, they did a tweet that's all eye emojis. And I'm just like, guys, what the hell are you doing? So we'll see. Oh, that's beautiful. The old expressionist collections for Mm. merchandise. Yeah. Those are beautiful, and I love them. But yeah, this see, it's all eye emojis from the Valiant three hours ago, but absolutely nothing since then. 
So, you know, we're going to finish recording and then an hour later it's going to be like, oh, by the way, we did this. Like, mm -hmm. But, 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 but. So, yeah, it's looking like that is all we have. Uh, it looks like the All-Star skins are available for purchase. And I already we got one should, of them. We, I am probably going to go pony up for the Mercy one because, yeah. god damn, we should talk a little bit about the All-Star lineup. Or should we save that for next week when save the All-Stars are actually happening? Save it. And I've, I've heard tell that what we have now is what the fans voted on, but that it's yeah. possible that staff will add other players. Yeah, like, because last time the, like, analysts and, you know, basically the personalities voting dictated things a little bit more. And I, we'll, we'll talk about this one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like the teams are a little bit uneven. Uh, the teams are not teams. Yeah. <laughs> you have people who hypothetically fulfill each role, but you have, I, I think on like Pacific, it's like two main tanks. Yeah, I think because it was tank and tank and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And then I think on... Well, for both of them, I think you have three or four members from one team and then one or two other people. Like, it was weird. Yeah, it's definitely just, like, a lot of we want to see this guy play rather than, like... Again, that I think that's why Pine was surprised to find himself on the Atlantic team, because Pine hasn't played all, all season. Yep. Because these aren't DPS. Like, yeah, yep. But we will talk about that later, and hopefully we will see a little bit more of how that develops after the stage finals. Mm -hmm. But yeah, should be interesting. Agreed. I'm very excited to see how the playoffs shake out. It's going to be bonkers. It's so going to be May. It's already May. Yeah. <laughs> And on that note, CJ, where can the people find you? At the raid at the underscore rage underscore nerd on Twitter. I also play in Overwatch Pretenders. I am the main tank for Mercury Cougars. We had our first game of the season and we won three two. Hell yeah! I was only actually able to be there for three maps uh, because of timing issues, but we still <laughs> won. Yay! Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, our next game is going to be sometime this week. The schedule hasn't been nailed down just yet, but... Uh, keep an eye out yeah, on the Twitters to find an, out. Keep an eye out on the Twitters to find out. Uh, follow Overwatch Pretenders on Twitter. They will post about matchups and join the Discord if you want to join a league about improving and playing in some structured tournament environments. All right. And I'm Katie. You can follow me all over the social medias as well as on YouTube and Twitch at Kiaxe. That is K-I-A-X-E-T. I am also on a whole slew of Rooster Teeth products. Products? Podcasts? Woo! <laughs> I'm on Rooster Teeth products. No. No, I am not. I am on a slew of Rooster Teeth podcasts with a wonderful group of co-hosts. We are under The Rooster Team. So anchor.fm slash The Rooster Team. Or if you just Google The Rooster Team, you will find us. Right now we're talking about Red versus Blue, and in a couple weeks it'll be Camp Camp. All that fun stuff. If you want to support us, you can support us on anchor.fm slash on the point. We do have the uh, anchor sponsorship there, so you can sponsor there. Also, supporting our sponsor supports us, so head over to fredsbs.com, F R E D S B S.com, and use coupon code on the point for 20% off your entire order. Follow us on Twitter. We are at on the point pod. And yeah, you know, tweet us, social media us. Let us know what you think about the finals. Oh, Let yeah. us know who you're picking to win or what your upset of choice would be. We want to know what you guys think. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, you good? Yep. Let's see nine. Woo!